Thank you, Shayna, for putting this together as always. And what a fantastic crowd. Um, friends, keep on eating, because next class we're going to talk about the idea of Judaism food, according to the Rambam, but that's not tonight. So you can eat freely and enjoy. Um, we're going to do a three-part series, God willing. Back to the Rambam. And the Rambam has a chapter in the Mishnah Torah called Hilchot Deyot. The laws of, I guess, the best translation I have of character traits. Okay, so you have your little packets on you. And I put Hebrew and English because the Hebrew is a little, some of the words are a bit more tricky as opposed to um, the last class that we did together. Okay, but you have questions, please stop me. Good? Fabulous. So let's start. So the Rambam is going to describe different character traits and whether character traits are adopted via nature or nurture. That's going to be the discussion he's going to have and he's going to try to figure out which traits are good, which traits are not so good. And by the way, please, this is an open class. If you have any questions along the way, email them to me and I'll be back in touch with you in a few weeks. I'm only kidding. You can ask at any time. Okay, fine. So the Rambam says, Every human has different character traits. And they're all different. We're all made up of very different character traits. And they're very, very, very distant one from another. We're all dealing with this. Yes, Adam, there are some people, Shabal Chema, who are just angry people. When I was driving here this evening, I think I was driving alongside such a person, just angry. And his or her driving, I couldn't see who it was, reflected their state of temperament. Do you ever those days actually when you feel like everyone's driving crazy? Do you ever those nights ever? And I thought, maybe that's me, and I'm just reacting to them. I don't know who it is. Okay, whatever it is. Baal Chemo Kuestamin always get angry. Viesha Adam. There are some people. Shedatom Yosheva Talav. They're just calm. The Enokas Klal. And they don't get angry ever. Right? We met such a person recently, me and you, in the kitchen a few minutes ago. Just calm and relaxed. And Imi Kast. And if they do get angry, Kasmat become a Shanim. Once every few years, that's not me. Wish it was, it ain't me. Some people are very, very proud people. Right? They have gava. Some people are very, very humble. Just lowly people. Some people have great desires. And they can't ever really fill their desires because there's just so many of them. Some people have a pure heart, Maud. And don't even desire things. They just don't, you know. They're just happy to go through life. Whatever their body needs, but that's it. Some people are very, very giving. Sorry, some people are very, very needy, I'm sorry. They have a very wide spirit. And nothing is ever going to satisfy them. Right? And he actually quotes King Solomon in Kohelet, Shlom HaMelech, Ohev Kesef, a person who loves money, you're never going to have enough of it. It's an endless, open pit of desire. Why he has to quote this one Midah with Shlom HaMelech, I'm not sure. We'll see. And some people, they don't have much desire. And they don't even want to grab what they can. Some people will torture themselves with hunger. Right? They don't need that much. And they won't even eat a single thing that they have. Without a lot of effort. Just to do that thing. And some people are going to ma'abed kol mamon bi adoladaton. Some people will just um, spend it. V'chal derachim elu shal kol der kol mahole v'one v'kile shewa achraza. And he says, and you're going to see it's true. Some people are stingy, some free-handed, some are cruel, some are soft-handed. We got the whole gambit over here. That's the way God made this world. We are not all the same. Just as two people do not share the same face, even identical twins, Weirdly enough, I met two identical twins tonight. They're exactly the same to me, but the mother promised me. I can always tell the difference. Just as two faces, right? Two faces are not the same. Two fingerprints are not the same. So too, two personalities are never the same. Great. 
That's his opener over here. Okay. V'yesh bein kol devedeim aharachokim amenu b'katzak. And each trait, I, and the contrasting trait at the other extreme. So this is important. Check this out. You have a trait, and then God made it that there's a contrasting trait as well. Okay? That means, and it has to be this way, that some people are very, very giving with their money, but there's a contrasting trait that some people are very, very stingy. So you have two extremes, two extremes over here. But it has to be that way, because without that, we don't have free will. You can't be rewarded for your acts of kindness if there wasn't a pull to the other side. Right? And he couldn't be punished for your bad desires and acts if there wasn't a good to reflect it. So in order to, for us to have free will, Bechira, there is always going to be opposite ends of the spectrum. Some traits, here is a discussion of whether it's nature or nurture. And what do you think he's going to say over here? Are our traits nature? Are we born with them? Or are they nurture? Are they learned? What do you think? What do you think? People have traits. You make people are just angry all the time. Were they born that way? Or did they acquire that trait? What do you think? Can it be a mix? So he's going to be like, yeah. Some people are just born with various traits. But that's a weird thing to say because we know that people are not born bad. They're not born bad. Right? In other religions, they're born, right? you're born into sin. Born. So we say, no, no, no. You could have a person who's born with a great desire for money. There are such people out there. They're born under a certain star sign. You have people who are born with a great desire um, to shed blood. So is that person bad? And the answer is no, they're not bad. It's how they apply it. They could become a murderer or they could become a surgeon. So we are born with innate traits. Everyone is born with innate traits. Right? Teva gufa. And sometimes you have a person that's going to have traits that they acquire more easily than others. I mean, I'm blessed with a number of children and they are all very, very different. When you meet them, they all seem pretty much the same. But you get to spend a few minutes with them. And by the way, you can tell very early. Within minutes of birth, you can see the various traits of various kids. One daughter of mine, I won't name who, one daughter of mine cried incessantly for a couple of years. And one was very calm and quiet. Right? If you met my daughters, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. It's just the way it is. They just came out that way. Right? So he learned them, or he turned on them. So however, he said, sometimes, however, however, sometimes, you may not be born with a trait, but you acquire it. How? Well, you may figure it out, or you see someone with that trait, or you go through a traumatic um, episode, a trauma, and you end up learning that trait from someone else. And that's how you deal with life. By the way, it's even true when it comes to Physical things, like, for example, is it genetically determined how tall a person should be? And the answer is, yeah, right? But a person could be malnourished, and they'll end up becoming shorter. Because maybe on a nature scale, they should be six foot, but if they're malnourished and don't take care of themselves, they'll end up being five foot two or three. So even if you have a natural inclination for some success, it could be you go through some trauma, physical, emotional, psychological, and you end up not being good. It's true physically, and it's true psychologically and emotionally, and here he's saying even spiritually. Okay. And therefore, you can take in and learn other traits from other people, whether good or bad. Cool? Okay, marvelous. Okay, bottom of the page. So let him build up. These various traits that we're talking about, and all the different attributes, he says, what you should not just do is go with your natural traits. That is not good. It's a weird thing to say, but God made me a certain way. I understand. But everybody is expected 
to learn about themselves, understand their own desires, and expect it to find out the right way to live. So for example, let's say a person is born with a trait, I mean, I don't think it's a trait, but they're born with a desire to, um, I don't know, make money, as we said. Okay. They're going to, they could, they could, people naturally like that. I had friends in school I was growing up, from day one, they were hustling, buying, selling, you know, candy, you know. And we so you could say, okay, that becomes their future. But that's not good enough. They're going to have to learn how to apply that goodness. That trait they've been given of, I don't know, mathematical ability, whatever it is, it's neither here nor there. What you're going to have to do is learn how to take it, channel it, and make good of it. Are you going to make money in order to waste it at the casino? Right? The casino is full of very smart people who are doing nothing in their lives, just like putting down money, trying to make... And there's people who take this trait and they use their mathematical abilities or their business abilities to make a living and help the world become a better place. That's a learnable skill that we all have to do. That's what the Rambam is saying. It's not enough to say, well, that's the way God made it and that's the end of it. It doesn't work that way. If he sees a person's You'll see your trait is leading towards a certain way, or you find yourself going another way, you still have to follow what he calls the Derech Yeshara. Now, here we come to the famous treatise of the Rambam, the straight path, which he also calls the Shvil Hazahav, the golden mean. Now, many people call Jews extremists, but actually the Rambam is not one of those people. The Rambam says it's not good to be an extremist. Our job in life is to know what the extremes are and then try to follow the middle path between them. That's what he's going to say right now. So you may have an inclination to be very, very giving, but you shouldn't be very, very giving. You may have a desire to be very, very stingy. Like he said, you shouldn't be too stingy. You need to learn how to calibrate and to figure out what that golden median middle path is, which he calls the straight path. Straight path between what? Between the two extremes. Don't be an extremist. You may say, well, I made a lot of money this year. I want to give 90% of my income away. If you have the desire, please let me and Shana know. <laughs> but it's not good. It's not the right way to be. You could think, oh, I make all that money. I don't want to give away my money. I work very, very hard for it. It should be that way either. There's a golden mean over here. It doesn't literally have to mean right down the middle. Okay, let's find the average of my 50%. When halacha, you should give away 10%, not more than 20. More than 20, you're a tipesh. Then you're going to basically give your money away and you're going to become a needy person taking from other people. So you've got to kind of, your, your whole life, actually the Raman's going to say, every decision we make ultimately in life is going to be, how do I calibrate and find this perfect mean between my character? If you find yourself getting angry all the time, but don't be a, a stone with no emotions. If God made these attributes, there's got to be a good in it. It can't be extremes one way or the other. And that's how he says. He says on the second page, Haderach Yashara, what is this straight path of which I speak? He mida beinonit. It's the middle. By the way, he mentioned elsewhere, I think we mentioned it in the Hilchot Teshuvah, those who were here for that discussion. He says, really, you're meant to see yourself all the time in the middle. That if I do one more good act, I'm on my way to being a tzaddik or a tzaddiket, a righteous person. I do one more bad act, that next act makes me into a rasha, a a bad person. That's how you, so a person says to you, are you a good person? No. Are you a bad person? No. What am I? I'm right in between. The next good act makes me into a great person. It's always about the next thing I do. That's going to define who I am. It's actually genius if you think about it, right? So you're not evaluating yourself. You're always thinking about what do I do next to put me on the right path. We're always, we're moving targets. And we're always on the cusp between good and bad. Always benoni, which by the way, we do on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, right? Rosh Hashanah, we say, is discernment and it's sealed on Yom Kippur. Well, I thought maybe Rosh Hashanah, he says, everyone who's a Benoni, it's sealed in Yom Kippur. Righteous people are sealed in Rosh Hashanah. We all celebrate Yom Kippur, which means every single person must see themselves at that tipping point between good and bad. I'm just reading what he says. 
שבכל דעה ודעה, מכל הדעות שיש לו אדם, that a person has, figure out the middle path. והדעה שהיא רחוקה משתי קצת רחוק. So don't jump to the extremes, evaluate, calculate, and find the middle path. For example, he says, let's see what he says of it. לא יהיה בעל חמה נוח לכעוס. If you're a person, right, who is easily angered, don't be so wrathful. But also, don't be like a dead person without feelings. ולא כמת שהוא מרגיש אלא בינוני. Don't be like that, right? Find it. Rather, find the intermediate course. So what's that? You should show anger only when it's really serious enough to warrant it. If God made a trait called anger, there must be a time when anger is good. But it's sparing. Actually, he's going to say that this one trait, maybe that's why he started with anger. He said this one trait of cast of anger, very sparingly. There's very little that comes from it. And even if you do get angry, it shouldn't be coming from inside. It should just be on the outside. When you use it, use it sparingly. It's there for a purpose. You should be passionate. You should have opinions. Right? Unfortunately, many people today, they're just like, you know, wet sponges. Nothing gets them angry or excited. You should feel it. Right? It's a natural thing. Right? Fight or flee. He's like, use it sparingly. I heard from one of my teachers, when it comes to kids, when do you show anger to them? You should never feel anger, which is tough. But he says, when do you show anger? When they do something that's dangerous to their life. You heard this before? So if a kid runs into the street, you know, we're like, naughty goy. Naughty girl, don't do that, because car hit you, make you into pizza. <laughs> Not good. Right? You don't say that. You say, no, bad, don't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. That's very, very dangerous. So he says, on the outside, you're showing anger, but inside, you've got to be calm. There's a famous story, I don't know if it's true, but it's mentioned many, many times, of a famous teacher, or rabbi, whatever it was, yeshiva, who was dealing with one of the kids, right, who did something very, very chutzpahdik. Two weeks after the event, he told them off about it. So the kid's like, why do we eat two weeks? This happened two weeks, why are you bringing this up, you know? So the, uh, the Roshiva said, because two weeks ago I was really angry. I had to wait for the anger to go, and now I can tell you off. I had to get it out of me, and now you can get a, f it's not about me anymore, it's about you and what you did. You hear? It's a deep, deep point. And therefore, he says, you shouldn't design anything other than which your body needs, and cannot exist without. Rather, you should, when it comes to eating, and by the way, that's why he's going to go from this discussion to eating, right? He's going to discuss foods, literally foods you should and shouldn't eat. It's fascinating. The Rambam actually goes into that in the Mishnah Torah, right? He's actually going to give you a menu, how to eat, when to eat, why to eat, all this kind of stuff. So he's saying that you, also when it comes to eating, you shouldn't overdo it. And by the way, there is a correlation between emotions and eating. That's the, the Rambam put these two together. I always think for a reason, right? Why is he, right? We, we all comfort eat. I'm saying this knowing full well I'm going to have a slice of cheesecake after this class. I get it. Having said that, right? He says eating should be to, do you live to eat or eat to live? It's kind of the thing, you know? But the Rambam's going to say later on that it's okay to eat some bad foods. Just don't overdo it, right? He's going to say that a little bit later, okay? By the way, just the, just the, I must talk about the connection. Where does this idea even come from? So he says it comes from Gan Eden. What happened in Gan Eden? We had a problem of people making bad choices, right? And getting jealous and anger and blame. And right afterwards, they ate from the tree. Ate from the tree yeah. It's, it's, there's a correlation between them. It's fascinating. Um, written in a number of places in the Sfarim. It's not a coincidence those two uh, came together. Okay? So he also says, don't be overly stingy or spread your money about. Right? You have to give charity according to what you're able to give. Right? You need to lend people as well. Okay? I mean, let's be honest. I'm sorry to stop for a second, but I deal with a lot of cases where money is involved, especially when it comes to family. And it's very, very often that when money gets involved, people feel as though their midok could be thrown out of the window. They really can. I find I just, I was just in London with my brother and sister and we were talking and I said, you know, it's very interesting. I've never seen a situation where a poor parent dies 
and the kids fight over the Yerusha, over the inheritance. It's very interesting, that, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? When is there a fight in the family? When the rich father or rich mother passes away, then there's a fight. A poor person dies, what are we going to do? You have that shoe, I have this shoe, what's going to be? <laughs> and by the way, think, well, okay, it's only if there's not much money involved. Oh, contraire. I've seen families who, where the father dies, he's worked his entire life, never spent a penny on himself, and he leaves over this Yerusha to the family. They fight and they argue. I'm talking big money. You would have thought, yeah, I'll be satisfied with five million. These are people who are splitting millions of dollars and they still fight over it. And you think it can't be. I've seen it so many times. Hell, I'm dealing with the case right now. I have someone today, by the way, who was dealing with this. Literally, it all falls apart. Every familiar relationship, gone. It's a big problem. And yet, the poor person dies and everyone has shalom, you know. Maybe that's why Hashem, as someone's put to me very nicely, if you want to know what Hashem thinks about money, look at who he gives it to. Right. Where it ends up, you know. So the Torah wants to avoid this. Hashem wants to avoid machloket. That's what this is really all about. Hashem wants to not have fighting in families. He wants to keep the Torah and the Rabbanim especially, hopefully want to keep the family structure together and not deal with this, you know, not deal with this, the, the calamity. And by the way, just as a side point, when these kids inherit these millions of dollars, I have found within a, it's taken decades to build it up. They came from the other country, Europe or Middle East or Persia, wherever it is. They work, work for years, get, and then the kids have it, and within one, two years, <clears throat> gone. Which, by the way, <laughs> since we're discussing it, is one of the reasons money is called zuzim. You know, in the, in the Gemara, right? Zabana bitre zuze. It's a, you know. So the word zuzim is an old word to describe money. Why is it called zuzim? Because money is zaz me makom la makom. It goes from place to place. You know? It doesn't sit in one place. One minute it's in one place, and then Hashem says, okay, you had it for a number of years, for a generation or two, and I'm over there. I know families that grew up, they were wealthy, wealthy families. The next generation comes, they squander it, they lose it, they invest it badly, all gone. Zazmi makom la makom. Okay? So we don't want that to define who we are. We don't want to be defined by this. We want to be defined by our good character decisions. Rather, he says, you shouldn't be... Uh, okay, so he's talking about extremes again. Don't be overly elated. Don't be so happy all the time, right? Don't laugh excessively, but don't be sad and depressed, right? It's also not good. You should be quietly happy. I want to look at the Lashon over here. Okay, You should give a little bit of money. Or Malve, you should lend some according to your ability. Don't be too laughing all the time. And not depressed. kol yamav. It's the words of the Rambam. Just be happy. Be happy with what you have. Yeah? It's difficult. It's easy. These are very easy words to read, I'll be honest with you. But to really be happy with what we have when we live in a world, I was discussing actually in class today at, uh, at uh, Stern, where we're surrounded by a world where we're constantly comparing ourselves to other people and what they have. Right? And I've mentioned before, compare leads to despair. That's right. <laughs> You know exactly my lines already. Okay? Uh, walk around with a happy countenance. Walk around looking happy. You should look happy. You should be smiling. Right? We mentioned already that your face belongs to the Roshuta Rabbim, the public domain. Yeah. What does he mean by don't be too happy? Some people are, well, he doesn't say too happy. He says that a person should be laughing all the time, constantly, you know? When I see people laughing all the time. I get suspicious. I'm like, what are they on? <laughs> there's, there's a, and usually they are. There's a limit. Right? The Shlomo Melech says it's a time to laugh, time to cry. Don't walk around the whole time like, yeah, woo, like you gotta. There's a limit. Right? Just have an, an inner shalva, tranquility, you know? He says it's true for all character traits. The derech zuhi derech. That's how wise people act. They're not extremists. They're following that middle path. Find yourself the middle. 
And that is a chacham. That is a wise person. He's now defined for you a wise person. A wise person is someone who is in control of their character traits. He's going to make a little exception over here. There is an exception to the rule, my dear friends. And this is a trait that the Rambam and others do not like. And that is, does anyone know what the worst of the traits is? I wouldn't have guessed it. Pride. Ga'ava. He does not like it. He says there's very, very little goodness that comes from ga'ava. If you're proud, and we have to define what that means, because the person should feel good about themselves, you know? So it's not what you think it is right now. But if a person constantly sees themselves as the best thing ever, we all met those people, they've always got the answer to everything, and they're full of themselves, it's all about me, me, me. He says that's a bad problem. Okay? There are times when you should be proud of your successes, but really, what should you be doing? You should be saying, my success comes from Hashem. And that's number one. Right? That's the opposite of pride. Because pride is, is I am the reason for my success. It's all about me. Right? Kochem Otzer Yadi. It's all of my brilliance that led me to this successful business, this successful venture, my good, whatever. It's all about me. And we're like, you know what? I'm blessed by God. I was born with certain traits. I'm blessed to have this ability. And more importantly, there's room for improvement. That's what a person has to, that's the, that's the way a person has to be. That means a person can stand there and say, with hands on heart, I am the best doctor in the world, and still be extremely humble. But aren't those two statements contradictory? Right? Yes, I'm the best lawyer in the entire world. No one's good as me. Maybe true. But why can you say that and, 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 be, and not be proud for it? And the answer is, because if you say, I'm very grateful, I have this ability, I was born with it, I have a wonderful family, I have great teachers, and there's room for improvement, I still, I still have something to learn, that's good. That's what, that is what you're going for, according to the Rambam. Okay? Having said that, what's the opposite of Ga'ava? Anivut. Humility. But even that should be sparing. Because if you're humble, what's, how do people usually define humility? Well, he says the person breaks themselves down and they say, well, I'm a nothing, I'm a garnished, you know, what am I? What can I do? What have I done? That's not good either. The good humility is, as I said, I'm great. I am very good at what I do. I'm a great uh, teacher, a great parent, a great businessman, a woman, and whatever it is, an engineer. It makes no difference. Everyone has their own, right? Okay, occupational theft. But it's a gift from God, and there's room for improvement. That's humility. All right? Not chronic low self esteem. That's not good. Or you say in Hebrew, yush. Right? Despairing, right? What's going to happen? That is not good at all. And he says that is true when it comes to <clears throat> these two traits of gava and humility. Find that middle path. Okay. Let's do a little bit more. Okay, any questions so far on anything so far? He's, he's just, we're just in the introduction. We're just building up over here. Are we good? The ultimate goal, says the Rambam, is going to be that you're going to work on yourself so that these traits you're working on become a permanent fixture in your personality. So let's say a person is born with a bad anger trait or they've adopted one because of some trauma in their life. The end goal is that a person is going to train themselves Yargil Adam atzma bedet elu in these good ones ad sheyikvu ba until they become a part of who you are. Whether even the thought of losing your temper, getting really angry, is not even possible. 
It'll become a permanent. And that's why he says, how do you meant to do this? He says the person should perform, repeat, and perform a third time the acts which conform to the stance of the middle road. It takes time, and it takes practice, and it's tough. And you've got to constantly do this until it becomes easy for you, for you able to overcome them. What well, even the thought of it, of losing my temper, or acting out towards another person, shouting, screaming, fighting, fighting whatever it is, just becomes an abhorrence to you. Okay? That's how he says, you know you have made this part of your personality. I skipped one paragraph. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But he says, where do we learn this from? He says, ultimately, you're learning this from Hashem. Because we give God various character traits. We say, God has um, graciousness. But you have to be gracious as well. God is merciful. You be merciful as well. God is holy. You have to be holy. Ultimately, we're all made with celebrated the image of God, he says. And that's why the prophets refer to God by other titles. He's slow to anger. Yep. He's very, very kind. He's righteous. He's just. Why do we give God anthropomorphic attributes? Why do we give God human attributes? God is not angry. He's not slow to anger. He's not any of these things. So for the Rambam, there's other ways to understand this. But from the Rambam's perspective, we give God these character traits so that we can understand them, so we can be like them. That's the idea over here. So we know that God, for example, visited Avram Avinu after he had a Brit Milah. Right? He had a Brit Milah. God visited him. Oh, you know what? I need to do that. Why? God doesn't need to visit people. So these events and stories are recorded in the Torah. That's what he's saying. So that we can learn from them. That's the whole point of it. We can become like God. Basically, it sounds weird, but that's it. We have the ability through our actions to act well. I'm going to add over here. Now, this is a little personal interlude from my experience of working with people. Some people I have found are not able. I can't say not able because he seems to say that everyone's able to overcome these traits. Some people are definitely not willing to overcome these negative traits. And they'll say, this is just who I am, and they will act upon them. For example, and I had this discussion this weekend with someone, and it fits very much into this. There are some people I've met who are just not capable of being married. I never used to say this. But I, my thinking has evolved on this. Everyone can get married. That's easy. Right? You just go, date, propose, right? Instagram, Facebook the petals in a heart-shaped form, right? And you both look fantastic. Take 500 photos and pick the best one and stick it online and then make your parents or family, whatever it is, pay for a chuppah, you get married and say, oh, anyone can do that. So getting married, anyone can do. Remaining married, I don't know if everyone's cut out for it. Is it nature? Is it nurture? Just some people just don't have the natural ability to work on their character enough to... Can I just share one? I just met with this lady, I mentioned who it was, and she told me something, and I asked if I could use it. She was in a first marriage, she told me. I'm not saying it is, so it's not a around. It was actually, she told me a lot of stories, but this one stuck with me. And she was in a marriage, and she was not happy in the marriage at all. Married for a number of years. And so she said she went out to, with her husband somewhere, and she's like, oh, I really could do with some ice cream. Right? He's like, yeah, but it's two blocks that way, and I house is two blocks that way. Forget about it. And she got so upset, so upset. Obviously, it was the, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. This wasn't the thing. This was just the symptom of this whole thing. And she got it, and she was upset, and she went, and then she walked into a bookstore, she said. Maybe it was that day or a day later. And she went to the marriage section. So she told me today. She said, I went to the marriage section and I saw these books on marriage. And then she said, you know what? And this is a big thing to admit. She's like, I decided it wasn't right. And she went to the self-help section. That's a very brave thing to do. I need to work on myself. There's us, but there's also me. And she realized that she had to do with certain traumas from this and childhood and all the other stuff that come with it. 
right? If you don't work on yourself, which is what the Rambam's saying, then every other relationship you're going to have is going to fall apart. It's just not going to work. It starts with you. And we're all very quick, myself included, and you've all been in relationships, I'm sure, right? You're dating someone, because I don't think none of you, none, any of you have been married yet, but you're dating someone very, very intensely, and it's getting... And you end up, oh, you be you and you and you. We all do. When you get married, it carries on. And really, if you're honest with yourself, most of those occasions, it's actually about yourself. A very bitter pill to swallow when you actually catch up on it. Yeah. How do you know if it's you or your partner? It's a very good question. A very good question. Look, no one's perfect. He's bringing his baggage. You're bringing your baggage. And you're putting this baggage together. Right? And he'll say something that triggers you, and you're going to say something that triggers him. I think I've mentioned before, I apologize if I have, the story of the woman in the elevator. I told you the story of this one. I was at a Pesach program many years ago in Mexico. You may have even been there, but you're not going to know who it was. And I was on the elevator. <laughs> Sorry, I came to my head, I must tell you, but I'm not avoiding your question. I'm on the elevator, and, Lee, and I walk out the elevator, and it's a Pesach program, so it was, uh, the weather was very, very hot. It's important. And I'm walking out, and as I walk out the elevator, I brush against this woman's arm. And she screams out, Ow! Oh my God! And she gets really angry. You really hurt me! Now, the elevator was full, and I'm the rabbi of the program. So I gotta become, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. In my head, I'm thinking, get a life. <laughs> I, just, I just touched you. What is your problem, woman? I didn't say that. I thought it. I didn't say it. Okay? I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, Apollo. And we walked out, and that was the end of it. I thought to myself, this woman's complete. She's nuts. That night, she came over to me at the, uh, whatever, during the dinner, whatever it was, and she goes, Rabbi, I want to apologize to you for my outburst, but it's very hot, and I was sunbathing, and I put sun cream everywhere, but I forgot to do my arm. And so I had really bad burn, and you touched it, and it really hurt me. That's what happened. I like to apologize. And I thought about that, and something occurred to me. Everyone has emotional sunburn somewhere on their personality. Something happened to them. It could be in childhood. It could be 10 years ago. It could be half an hour before. And you're going to say something, and they are going to explode. And you're going to be like, where did that come from? And in most cases, it's not about you. It's, it's them. It's stuff they never dealt with. Right? In her case, she should have put more cream in her arm. Right? So I, I understand her outburst. I, I'm not I'm unhappy that she did it, but at least I get it. Everyone's dealing with stuff. Trauma from a teacher, an event. It could be anything. Right? It could be a family situation. We're all dealing with stuff. Our job is to kind of like release that trauma, I don't know what, how you want to word it, and to work on ourselves in order to fix that part of our personality. So back to you. Who is it? In the end, it's going to be a little bit of both. I've dealt with many toxic relationships where they're both at fault. I've seen times you have two good people, but they just fall upon hard times, or they're, you know, or they're just hungry. <laughs> so... Can I tell you every fight, every argument, who's to blame and how it works? I do know that ultimately everyone's going to have to work on themselves. That's what it comes down to because you can't change anybody else. That's for sure. And by the way, I'll mention it too. I think about this a lot, you know, when it comes to parents. We're looking into other families as well, but I've seen kids who come from the worst families I got a friend of mine whose father was in prison, terrible, terrible life. She was, you, you may, you'd never know. She had no relationship with her father, out of touch with her, whenever was in touch with her, it was a terrible, tragic. Married, husband, fantastic kids. You know, she's able to put it together. And as people come from amazing families, like someone I know very, very well, father's a big, famous rabbi. Kid's an absolute animal. Just can't get it together. Made a lot of money. Acts disgustingly towards his ex. -wife. I just, it's horrible. Right, what this person did. If you met the parents, you'd never call it. You'd never call it. Was he born that way? Is it nature? Is it nurture? In the end, 
I don't care. Don't act like that. That's what Rambam's saying. No matter how you ended up with this personality trait that you're dealing with, and we're all dealing with extremes, either you have a great desire for money or for power or for, excuse me for saying it, for marital, extramarital relationships, whatever it is, we're all dealing with it. You've got to try to rein it in. That's your, that is why you are alive, according to the Rambam. Yeah. That's a tough question. Do I think that people should not get married until they work? To a degree, yes. No one should get married unless they have at least a little sense of self. But you don't have to only wait till you're a finished product because you're never a finished product. Again, I've seen people get married at 20 who are extremely mature and I'm dealing with people in their mid-30s and 40s and 50s who are big, fat babies who just can't get it together. There's always, you can't wait for everything to be. How do you know when is like... There is no general rule for that. It depends on the person and they need to have an advisor to help them. I, I can't answer that question. How do I know? Everyone's different. Everyone's different. But people have the attitude that I need to work on something already that they're moving in the right direction. Everyone has to wait. Again, I see some kids and I think they need more time. They need more time. There's a phenomenon, I'm so sorry, just one last piece, but hold on to your question, I want to hear it. There's a phenomenon, a lot of girls come back from seminary in Israel, right? And they're on a high, and they, it just happened to my daughter's very good friend. She came back, and young girl, and the parents wanted to, you know, marry off, they thought it was a solution. I called this from the beginning, by the way. I called this, she got back, and she dated straight away, and within a few months of getting back from seminary, she was engaged and married. And now, six months, it's done. It's not good. It's not not good. She was not ready. There's no doubt about it. They need time to come back and to compress and to hit the earth and to kind of like, you know, level out. You know, everyone's different. Yeah. If you have a guy or a girl that's like, an exceptionally amazing person, but after doing research, you find out that the family's not so amazing. Would you recommend to that person to go out with a girl or guy? This is an ancient biblical question. I could not sit here right now and say, if you meet a fantastic person who comes from a bad family, don't marry that person. Because if that were the truth, Avram Avinu would not be married. Yitzchak would definitely not be married. Yaakov would be married. They all came from crazy families. Sarah would be like, I'm looking to this guy. He's so cute. He's a big tzaddik. But his father sells idols. <laughs> he wouldn't be married. Right? And Yitzchak would be like, well, I'm looking for a girl. Right, I found her. She's a great tzaddikah. But her father and her brother, they're nuts. Stealing, obsessed with money. So you can't avoid that our greatest avot and imaot came from pretty wacky families. So I know everyone's looking for Avram Avinu today would not get a shidduch. I'm sorry. If I told you I've got a great guy for you, his father's got the biggest church supply across Asia. In the, that's exactly what it was. He sold Avod Zara. So you can't. Now, having said that, it depends on the person. Some people are able to tolerate and to marry into that. They're able to do it, right? I know one of my, someone I know, I'm giving everything, I'm changing things in the background, but someone I know, um, again, father walked out on her, but, and has no, and the boys are able, they're able to marry and be okay with that. But I know some people who are like, I can't marry that. I want to marry a family where I go to them for Shabbat and there's a, uh, a father-in-law and a mother-in-law together having dinner. I don't want to sit with either one. So everyone has to know what they're able to do. So I can't say you can't marry a, you know, child from a divorced family, right? Because for some people, they're able to handle that. And for some people, they can say, I know people don't like to hear this, but it depends. And some people, it's very, very important. You've got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is, if we just turn people away because they come from bad families, we're left with nothing. Because by the way, most families, there's a little bit of baggage going on. There's always a skeleton as my... My Rebbitson of my Bet Knesset, right? I'm, 
have a rabbi and his wife was talking to my wife. My wife told me this in her name. She said, every shidduch I made for all my kids and these are good kids. At some point, some skeleton came out of the uh, closet. Something came, she called it like the big bang. A big bang came and we found out something that I had we known about, but Hashem wanted it that way. So it didn't come out until the right time. Yeah, There's always a bomb. There's always a bomb that's going to come out. Okay, it is what it is. We're going to do. It can't, there, there is no perfect, complete scenario. Okay? Any other thoughts, comments, questions? I hope so, because I wasn't going to go any further tonight. I want to leave chapter two to next class. So let me just quote another Rambam, if I may, for the remaining few moments we have, and I'll take more questions. And it goes like this. The Rambam is, says elsewhere in relation to what we're discussing over here. And I'm going to summarize what he says already. He says that the entire reason we are alive in this world and the entire reason, I probably should have started with this actually, it would make sense, but now it'll make more sense. The entire reason Hashem created this world and put us in this world is in order for us to make the right character trait decisions. That's why we're here. And then he goes even further, and this is the key punchline to everything we're saying today. He says the entire reason Hashem gave us all the Torah and all the mitzvot is in order for us to work on our character traits. He doesn't just say, well, it makes sense. Give sadaqah, you'll become a righteous person, right? Don't get angry, become a righteous person. He says, all the mitzvot, this is in Hilchot Tamura, by the way, all the mitzvot come ultimately from the great advice he calls God, it's a rochok, that God says, I'm going to give you mitzvot for you to be able to work on your character and become a better, nicer version of yourself. That is the Rambam. If I had my way, I'd print that piece of Rambam and put it up on every single yeshiva. That's the reason in this world. All the mitzvot come together for you to become a better person in relation to other people. That's the entire game. When you look back at your life, you are going to be graded, right, somehow in the spiritual realm of how you treated other people. He doesn't say you're going to be graded according to how kosher you were. I'm sure that's true or not true. I mean, Shabbat is an all-important mitzvah, but ultimately the ultimate grading, says the Rambam in Hilchot Murah, is how you worked on your dayot, on your character traits. That's it. And that leads to this discussion, which is, well, where are you on the scale, and how are you going to find that golden mean, the shvila zahav, the derech ishara, to calibrate your various desires that you have. That's the test of who you really are. I will mention, one last piece, I'm so sorry, but it's coming to my head, so I must mention it. Maybe that's why the word for character trait is a Mida. And the word Mida means measurement, right? Mida is a measurement in plural Midot. So a character trait is actually a measurement. So I used to think Mida, measurement, character trait is a Mida. Measurement, character trait. Well, yeah. How do you measure a person? By their character. And that's true. Right. We even say in English, how does he measure up? How do they measure up? Yeah. However, there's another way to look at it, which is the exact opposite. Maybe the same reason the word mida is character trait is not just because you're going to figure out what a person is like from their midot, their character, but actually, how do you respond to various events in your life and how do you measure your response to them? So if someone is mean to you, how do you measure your response in relation to them? If someone's nasty to you, do you get angry, shout, scream, fight? So maybe the word mida, measurement, is the same as character trait because you're expected to measure your response to all the stimuli and all the events and all the episodes that happen to you in your life. Maybe that's why it's a measurement. Someone says one thing to you you don't like. 
So what, you don't talk to them for a week? Well, does that fit? That's, that's a mismeasurement. Just say, don't say that again. Just don't take it so personally, whatever it is. You've now mismeasured your response to that, that event that's happened to you. You've got to measure how you relate to them. Yeah. Someone cuts you off in traffic, right? What you want to do is go crazy and shout and show them, you know, digits of your hand. But I'm going to measure my response. So my and me dot are actually based upon how I respond to all these events that happen to me in my life. Maybe that's another reason why the word mida, actually it is another reason, is actually a character trait. Good? Questions, thoughts, comments, yeah. So the Rambam actually mentions elsewhere that we're not extremists in religion either. Beryl Wine always quotes the Rambam when he describes this. And he says that you can't overdo it either. There's, there's a limit to certain things. How do you, you know? know what's too much? It depends which community you're in. Like if you, ask, like you know, if you ask any person, right? Okay, okay we know what your parents are. Parents. <laughs> you're very two religions. <laughs> Please. <laughs> How many phone calls do I get from people? <laughs> Rabbi, my daughter, lovely girl, could come to your class, but now she's a little too religious. Right? They always say like that, don't they? <laughs> so the general rule I have found is that wherever you are, if a person is to the left of you, they think you're an extremist. All right? And if they're to the right of you, they think you're like, you know, not religious at all. Mm-hmm. It's all a matter of perspective. It depends on, on community. It depends. You've got to figure out where you are in your community and figure that out. I am, personally, those who know me well, I'm not in favor of young people who are living at home becoming religious extremists while they're living at home with their families and breaking, out, breaking down the family. I will find every leniency I can for that person to eat at home still, to go on vacation, to hang out with their family. There are other rabbis who do not follow that path. And like the kid wants to be, and I've had very many heated discussions about this with people of when they see a kid religious, like, that's what they should do. And if that means they should not eat by other family, they'll eat at home by themselves. I don't like that. I don't believe that. And I've received this from my rabbanim. I'm not, it's not my own opinion. That's not the way to be. If you want to have a very kosher home, you want to hold a higher standard, then do it at your own home one day. Right now, you're living under your parents' roof. You're going there and you will find every leniency you can in order to eat over there. I do not believe that's what Hashem wants. Hashem does not want us to break our families apart. I don't like it. And there are, I'm to say, many yeshivot where they actually encourage that. I believe that is cultish behavior. So it depends where your community is from. Hashem puts you in a community to start your life on, on purpose. There wasn't a coincidence. And then you can make your way from there at a slow, healthy pace. But I don't like it when people say, Mom, Dad, I'm not eating at home. There is no greater insult to a parent, especially a Sephardi parent, especially a Persian parent, by the way, saying, your food is not kosher enough for me. When, by the way, in most of the cases it is. And this person two weeks ago was out doing who knows what. Who says you could do such a thing? We're talking about here, the mitzvot of midot over here, and you think that this is worth any less than eating kosher? The same Torah that says don't eat pig, the same Torah gives another Esau that says, don't get angry, don't be jealous, don't take revenge. Don't bear a grudge. It's the same Torah, same mitzvot. So I am personally not in favor of it. But then again, I've seen a rabbanim who will be like that. And they'll be like, if that's what it takes, then break off from your family. To me, that is cultish behavior. And it usually, I have found, ends up working out bad. Doesn't work out good. I've seen... Parents get very turned off. I've seen many parents come back, or should I say, become more observant through their kids. All right? It usually happens. One yeah, yeah. Um, what if you end up moving to a community that's not as religious? Then Why would you do that? I don't know. Let's say like your husband gets a job somewhere and, and it's not a religious community. Yeah. So if a person is forced to move to a community, then they become the religious family of the community and they have an opportunity, Chabad style, to influence other people through nice, generous invitations. I've had many people come to my Shabbat table, many, who were not religious at all. They usually always started with a Friday night, 
then driving away, then another Friday night, then driving away, then another Friday night, then a Friday night and a Shabbat morning, and then driving away, and they end up keeping all the Shabbat. Many. My kids have seen it all. They are not phased by this. Okay? Some families don't like that. I believe that everyone has the potential to, to become a... That's why my Rosh Hashiva used to say, I don't like the idea of a kira professional. Outreach page. didn't like that expression. He said, I don't like it. I remember him saying it, Robert Rakowski. You should live and be well. I don't like that. Everyone's involved in this. So that's an opportunity. If a person has to go because the husband's got a job somewhere or a medical school, they've got to live somewhere else, then they and they're literally one of the few religious families, and then they become the Chabad Shiluchim of that community. You're not balancing out. You're staying like... That. You're staying where you are. No, 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 no. You're staying where you are. No, you can't. You can't give in. That, that, that becomes your family. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. I don't mean you go over there and say, well, I've got to balance myself out compared to all the other people living around me. No, you've got to keep true to yourself. No, you've got to keep true to yourself. You can't do that. Yeah. Okay, so I agree with you. I don't know if I'm wording this correctly. <clears throat> but then when it comes to dating and how you want to have your family in a certain way, when other people look at you, they look at you at where you are currently with your own family, which may not be how you see yourself raising your future family. Absolutely. So then, how does that work? While you're dating, you say, <coughs> this is the way my parents bring me up. I love them. I appreciate it. Right? And they got it from their parents. <laughs> they didn't come out of the way. And they moved to the right. I want to be at a different place. And I'm telling you, this is what I want to be. But, a lot of but you, need to see, even... you need to see steps towards it. I don't like it when you have a girl who's Shema Shabbat and a boy is not or vice versa. And like, oh, when I get married, I will be. I need to see some steps towards it. But also nowadays, people won't even like, if they hear where you are now, they're like, okay, I don't even want to go out. Okay, so they've misjudged. I'm not. Okay. So you've gone back to the thing again. So how, how, how much is a person judged by their parents? Then that person's not meant to be with you. Consider that to be a filter. Great. One from, you know, 100,000, I'd have to date. If they can't see through, then they're not for you. Okay. That's just the way it is, yeah. What is, I'll give you a very good example of it because I hear this a lot. They say, oh, when I'm... So fine. Then don't use your phone. Show me something that shows me you're moving this direction and show you're doing it for yourself. Right? Show you're doing it for yourself. So when you're by yourself, show me that you're able to... Right? You're not doing it for me. You do it for yourself. And stop that, for example. It's got to be something. It can't be like, I lit candles. That's a great mitzvah. But that's not changing you. Show me something where you're able to, you know, I'm not going to use, maybe start with a Friday night. I'm very, very much into incremental improvements. I really am. Which is hard to say because I'm basically, you know, legitimizing using a phone on Shabbat, right? Afternoon as opposed to Friday night. But it needs to be incremental. But that, that for me is a very clear sign that a person is serious about one day. Because you don't need to use your phone. You want to use your phone. That's a big one. Yeah. So what if they are doing it for you, though? Like you said, like you have to show that you're doing it for yourself. Is it like bad or like maybe not meant to be for someone? It doesn't, right, it doesn't sound very, very good. Great question. It doesn't sound good doing it for someone else. But you know what? I do a lot of things for my wife I don't want to do. <laughs> I take out the garbage. I used to change diapers. She'll deny it ever happened. But at least happened once or twice, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. We all do things. So it's not such a bad thing. The question is, am I resentful about it? That's the difference. Am I resentful? All of marriage, every relationship we're in, you got to work. I don't want to be here. I want you just to pay me to sit at home. Yep, I've got to turn up and do some job as well. So we all do that in relationships. Why should we be different? So it's, it's also about to change for someone else. Question is, am I able to be okay with that and be happy with it and not be resentful? Yeah, I just feel like, like something more like religious and spiritual is different than like chores. Like that no I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm able to take a change because I love this woman very, very much. I wanted to make this change in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I actually maybe agree with you a little more because like, I, for some reason I thought about it a little like conversion. Like when someone converts to someone, it's big if um, they're not doing it for themselves. <laughs> so almost like if someone starts becoming more religious for you, Right. There is a possibility that, that could happen. Although while you were talking, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of a case, 
a number of cases where I have a Jewish boy dating a non-Jewish girl, because that's usually the way it is, by the way, as a side point. I have no stats on that, but anecdotally from my experience, right? And then he brings her along because she's not Jewish enough, right? Well, she isn't Jewish at all. And she comes and she starts to learn. Right? And she's doing it for him. She won't be learning with a rabbi. I know many cases like this. I'll tell you one case, actually. She was like, she was not Jewish. I mean, she had a Jewish identity. I think her father was or something. And she started to learn more and more. And she starts to enjoy it, right? And then she becomes so religious that he's not, and she dumps him. <laughs> and she's now a Rebbitson. <laughs> there are many such cases like that. Many cases like that. He gets the credit, though. If he's moving with her, that's something else. He gets the credit. Does he get the credit? Yes. He introduced her to the religion. Half the credit. <laughs> I, I don't know how that works, I'll be honest with you. I hear it. If he's moving with her and he's not being a hypocrite, like sending her off to go in, like, you go do it, right, and I'm going to play golf, that's not good. But if they're working on it together, and he's like, you're not just doing it, I'm going to do it with you, that's why when a girl comes to me and says, I want to convert, or vice versa, right, I make them both sit in front of me. They both need to be there, because you're doing it together. Maybe that's the difference. Is he like just like shunting her forward and you go do it or let's do this together? So is it still like if it's something you're doing together, is it still like show me you cannot go on your phone and all these things? That's, that's if they're dating and they're doing and you want to see evidence that they're moving towards this goal. Then yeah. I'm just, I, I have found that to be an effective sign that this person serious about wanting to do it themselves. But you know what? And let's tie it back to this discussion. The key over here, and I didn't used to think that I have found, I've seen, you know what? Let me put it to you like this too. Listen very carefully. I know families of boys and girls who date and get married and they're exact same level and they have terrible marriages because they have bad and be dot. But religiously exactly the same level. Both religious families, Beis Yaakov, Yeshiva, get married and it's all... <laughs> Why? We're on the same level. We're doing it because we want to do it. And yet they're having a relationship. And I see where the guy is religious and girl is not, or vice versa. Yeah? And they're able to make it work because they have good and me don't. Because he's thinking, how can I make you happy? She's thinking, how can I make you happy? If you have that attitude, you'll work it out. If my entire essence is, how can I make you happy? And yours is, how can I make me happy? And that's the way you're looking at life. Then it's going to work out. I think I mentioned the story. While I was dating my present wife, well, she... <laughs> My wife. So we were, um, we were dating. So I dated a long time. It took me time to, you know, find a victim, a, a wife. So we were dating, and I took her to see my rabbi, Rabbi Braun. She lived and be well. Very great, very great man. We went to, so he said, I want to talk to this girl. Uh, he said, step outside for a moment, right? So I stood outside, and I saw they had a glass panel. I saw them schmoozing. And she was in a few minutes, and I said, what did you discuss? She goes, oh, it's personal. And I thought it was about me, wasn't it? Of course it was. And then I went in, and he sat down with me, and he says, you know, she seems like a very wonderful lady, and I think it's very good. But remember, if you marry this girl, she's your queen. That's how you've got to see her. She's your queen, and whatever she wants, you've got to do, your job is to treat her like a queen. A little while later, after we were married, I said, by the way, when you went in with her, what did he tell you? He said, if I marry you, you're the king. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he wants, you should try to do. So that was his clever technique of being it. It worked for a couple of months. So really, it, 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 if you have good midot, you'll get away with even bigger. And by the way, you'll see some, you don't find something among Ashkenazim for the most part. You see it amongst the Faradim. Right? It's true, especially among Persians. And Syrians, I've seen it. But not among Ashkenazim for some reason. We have the girl who's up here and the guy who's down there, religiously or there, and it actually works out. Weird, right? You have you seen that? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not imagining it, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you ever see the girl, like, lower her religion, or is it always a guy? Ah, very, very good question. I, I, I give you my pasak on this. I have found that of the two, it's better if the girl's a little above. And there's technical reasons for that. She should be a little bit higher. All right? Let's be honest. The main reason is because the th main areas of a life 
our kashrut, which for the most part, with all due respect, you know, the woman kind of controls, right? Family purity, woman's hands, right? And Shabbat Chagim. So of the two, it's okay for the girl to be a little bit higher. Of the two. You'll bring him up. Yeah. What do you consider like a little bit higher? It could be anything. I've seen it all. Again, I've, I know a guy who's in a very, very good marriage. He actually is way more religious than his wife. They just stay, they love each other. And she's out shopping on Shabbat and he goes to bed Knesset. And they're a very good marriage. And she loves him. And she makes sure everything's kosher at home and this thing. But she says, I don't want to go to shul, I want to go shopping. It's my one day off. And, you know, this is once they were married. He became religious. He, he turned the game on her. You know what I'm saying? He's the one who became, you know, she's lovely. She's just not interested. And she, he took her to classes. She comes to my classes. I'm still very, very close to them. They're like close friends of ours. And she's just, you know. So the difference is almost irrelevant. I'm telling you, it comes down to this midot thing. I'm telling you, you got to trust me. Because I feel like now everyone puts so much focus on you have to be on a similar, if not same, if not similar religious level. Like I promise you, I used to, I, I promise you, I'm embarrassed to say, I used to say that. I used to believe, and I would say, try to find someone as close to you as possible. Now I believe, I really believe this, I'm not just saying this, it's okay to be a little bit different with better character traits. I am also highly unimpressed, and I used to be impressed by this, I'm embarrassed to say, by people who would come from big, prestigious religious families. Like, oh, that guy's father, Joe's you know father is? It means nothing to me. It doesn't even register anymore. I've seen kids who come from the most religious families who act disgustingly, and kids who come from nothing become great people. I don't even, I don't even see, and I promise you this, I used to notice this, going back, the yarmulke a boy was wearing. And I would judge a person by the size and type of yarmulke kippah they were wearing. I promise you, I don't even see if they're wearing yarmulke or not. I don't even notice it anymore. I promise you. I don't know if you know if your father's wearing a yarmulke tonight. I don't care. I didn't even know. I didn't, I didn't even see these things. I'm sure he was. He's a tzaddik. But I'm saying, I didn't even read it. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. I've seen boys with big yarmulkes going from yeshiva there, and they act terribly. I'm mean, not all of them do. And I've seen some boys who don't wear kippot right, and they want something and they put the yarmulke on their head, right? It comes out of the glove compartment, it comes out of the pocket, put it on their mouth, and they, before they eat or something, before they go to, to fill up. Great, great boys. Okay, there's a social aspect, there's a cultural thing that comes with this as well. I'm not putting it down. Right? You've got to find. But we've put way, not, we've put way too much emphasis on these things. Way too much. I didn't used to speak like this. I've changed. Okay, happy birthday to me. <laughs> Let's have some cheesecake. Thank you so much.